In this first video of our organic chemistry unit, we will be introducing organic compounds and starting to talk about alkanes. For this unit, we want to start by talking a little bit about how we want to approach this unit because this unit is very different than previous units. It's very, very qualitative. It's very, very detailed, but it follows very specific patterns. And if you can recognize the patterns, this material becomes much easier. So we're going to go through this material in such a way that makes the pattern recognition a little bit easier because that's the key thing to performing well with organic compounds is recognizing the different patterns. So what we're going to talk a lot about in this unit are functional groups. And when we say functional groups, what we mean are different types or categories of organic compounds. And for each functional group, there's going to be three things that we really care about, that we're really going to discuss. And that's the properties, some of the physical properties, things like solubility in water, you know, things like that, whether they're polar or nonpolar. We'll discuss the nomenclature. So organic nomenclature involves naming compounds and writing structures. And what we also care about are the reactions. How will these specific organic molecules transform into other organic molecules? So the way the book has this laid out is that it is spread across multiple chapters and each chapter deals with a handful of different functional groups and in that chapter it'll discuss the properties the nomenclature and the reactions the most difficult thing dealing with the organic compounds is the reactions because you need to be very very proficient with the properties and the nomenclature in order to fully understand the reactions so each chapter will go through different functional groups, like chapter 12, well, one of the functional groups it talks about are alcohols. And I'll talk about the properties, and I'll talk about the nomenclature, and then I'll talk about the reactions. And then also in that chapter, there'll be different functional groups, like aldehydes. And then the book will talk about properties, nomenclature, and reactions. We're going to, in these presentations, organize it a little bit differently in order to highlight and really showcase the patterns that exist. So the order we're going to tackle things in is first we'll deal with an introduction to organic compounds and alkanes and their nomenclature. And in that way, we will learn the basic rules that apply to all other organic compounds. Then what we'll do next, what we'll do second, is we will do the rest of the functional groups, properties and nomenclatures. What we're going to do is we're going to save all of the reactions until the very end. Because once you get better writing organic molecules and seeing a bunch of different structures, the reactions become less difficult. So in order to see the patterning a little bit better, we're going to save all of the reactions for the end. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this because this is important in terms of, you know, when you're reading along in the book, trying to match up with PowerPoint slides and places in the video, you're going to kind of the first time through, just kind of skip over the reactions. We'll be coming back to the reactions at the end the first part is really focused on properties and nomenclature. So when we say organic compounds, what do we really mean? So when we're talking about organic compounds, and that's what everything in this unit revolves around, what we're really talking about are compounds that contain carbon and hydrogen. Every organic compound will contain these two elements. Often there are additional elements in there as well, things like oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, phosphorus, sometimes halogens, but you will always see carbon and hydrogen. 
Organic compounds are sometimes called carbon-containing compounds. We're going to see carbon really provides the backbone for all the different structures that we're going to see. Organic chemistry is sometimes called the chemistry of carbon. And for all the different structures we're going to see and all the different organic compounds we're going to look at, and we're going to see many, many, many structures. Each element usually has a typical number of bonds that you see it possess in these organic compounds. Now there's some exceptions that we talk that we're going to talk about later when we start dealing with some of the reactions. But when you see these elements, you really want to associate each specific element with a specific number of bonds. And for carbon, we want to associate carbon as having four bonds. We're going to write hundreds, if not thousands, of carbon atoms going through this unit. Every single carbon atom that you're going to write will end up having four bonds to it. Nitrogen usually has three bonds. There are some exceptions, but that's where we want to start thinking about nitrogen having three bonds. Oxygen, we usually associate oxygen with two bonds. Sulfur also with two bonds. You're going to see thousands of hydrogen atoms in this organic chemistry unit. And what you'll see for every single one of them, one bond. And halogens also generally have one bond. So when we're looking at the structures, this is a quick way to really kind of notice firsthand when you're looking at a structure is you're going to see each of these elements usually have that number of bonds associated with it. Before we start doing some actual structures of compounds, we want to do a little comparing and contrasting. We kind of want to compare organic versus inorganic compounds because we've already talked a lot of, about a lot of different compounds. Those have been mainly inorganic compounds. Those things we talked about in Unit 2. We did inorganic nomenclature where we wrote formulas and names. So you've seen a lot of inorganic compounds already. We want to compare what we've seen before versus what we're going to be starting in this unit when we're starting to talk about organic compounds. So we want a little table to kind of highlight the key differences. And again, these are general statements. There's going to be exceptions on each side, but these are the things that as soon as you hear an organic compound or you hear an inorganic compound, these are generally the first things you can think about. So for organic compounds, we talked about they will always have carbon and hydrogen. Sometimes you'll have nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, halogens in there as well. Remember, if we think back to what we did with the inorganic compounds, we were looking at the entire periodic table. All different sorts of metals, transition metals, non-metals. We were everywhere on the periodic table for the inorganic compounds. Our organic compounds we're really focused on carbon, hydrogen, and a couple of these other elements. When we start looking at some of these actual structures, you're going to see that these organic compounds have many, many atoms in the structure. These are big molecules. Generally, the inorganic compounds we've talked about previously had relatively few atoms or ions in the structure, and that's a big difference. For our organic compounds, we usually associate them with being covalent or molecular in nature. There's some exceptions to that, but most of our organic compounds are going to be covalent. Generally, when you think about an inorganic compound, first thing that usually pops into mind is that they are ionic. Are there molecular inorganic compounds? Sure. But if you think about the number of molecules we've dealt with, the majority of them have been ionic. So remember, these are general statements. There's going to be some exceptions on each side, but generally you associate organic compounds with being covalent. Inorganic compounds usually are ionic. Organic compounds are usually nonpolar. Are there some exceptions to that that will be polar? Yes, and we'll talk about those. 
inorganic compounds usually are very, very polar. Most of them are ionic, so ionic is like the most extreme polarity you can have. And again, are there exceptions? Are there inorganic compounds that are nonpolar? Sure. We've talked about some of them, things like chlorine gas, Cl2. But generally, the first thing that pops into your mind for inorganic compounds is very, very polar. Generally, organic compounds are not usually that soluble in water. Are there exceptions? Yes, we'll talk about some that are soluble in water, but most of them are not soluble in water. Meanwhile, inorganic compounds, most of them are usually very soluble in water. Organic compounds usually have very low melting and boiling points. Many of them are liquids or gases at room temperature. Some of them, even the solids, generally have very low melting points. For inorganic compounds, what you usually see with our inorganic compounds is very high melting and boiling points. When you think about our classic inorganic compound, sodium chloride, you think about that very high melting point that's associated with that. Now, the last property we want to talk about is flammability. Will these things burn? Organic compounds tend to be very, very flammable. They burn very easily and very readily. Inorganic compounds, usually most of them, not flammable. Again, these are general statements. Will you occasionally see a inorganic compound that is nonpolar? Sure. That's going to happen. Will you see organic compounds that are polar? Yes. But these are kind of the general statements. The first thing that kind of pops into your mind when you're thinking about what are the general properties of most organic compounds? What are the general properties of most inorganic compounds? We'll be starting organic nomenclature in a little bit, and what we need to do is we need to make sure that we have memorized these prefixes that get used in organic nomenclature. These get used over and over and over again every time we are naming an organic molecule. And some of them you're going to be familiar with, and some of them are kind of going to be new. So these are the prefixes used in organic nomenclature. And since organic compounds are based upon a carbon skeleton, a carbon backbone, these prefixes are going to relate to a specific number of carbon atoms. So the ones you're probably not as familiar with, the new ones, are the first four. Meth, eth, prop, and but. Meth is one carbon, eth is two carbons, prop is three carbons, and but is four carbons. Those are the ones you are most familiar with, most likely. When we start getting up to five through ten, these you're a little bit more familiar with. When you look at five through ten, you're noticing things that you're familiar with. They kind of match the geometric prefixes. A pentagon has five sides to it, so five carbons. They're also matching those prefixes we used in the organic nomenclature previously in that course. Hexagon has six sides, hex is six, hept, seven, oct, an octagon, like a stop sign, known, nine, ten, being deck. You're familiar with these both from their use as geometric prefixes, you're also familiar with them from our previous nomenclature when you saw these were also used for our inorganic compounds. So these are things that we'll need to be memorized in order to successfully name compounds and draw structures. The first type of organic compound we want to talk about, or the first functional group, are the alkanes. Alkanes only contain carbon and hydrogen. There are no other elements in an alkane other than carbon and hydrogen. And what makes an alkane an alkane is that 
all of the carbons are singly bonded to each other. You will not see any double bonds. You will not see any triple bonds. So we have only carbon and hydrogen, and all the carbons will be singly bonded to each other. These end up being relatively nonpolar, and that's because carbon and hydrogen tend to have very close electronegativity values. Because the electronegativity values are so close, almost identical, these compounds are very nonpolar. Because they're nonpolar, these will not be water soluble. Remember, water is very polar. These compounds are nonpolar using that like dissolves like principle like things in terms of polarity will dissolve these are not alike the alkanes are very nonpolar water is very polar these are not going to mix and dissolve in each other you're probably most familiar with alkanes as their use as fuels and you'll recognize some of the names when we start doing examples of these the ending that we're going to use, so we're going to begin organic nomenclature. And the ending that we end up using for alkanes is you're going to notice an A-N-E ending. All of our alkanes are going to end in their names in A-N-E. We're going to look at starting to draw structures and name compounds that are alkanes. So at the top of the screen, you're going to see our first alkane. And how do we recognize it as an alkane? We're going to try to name this structure. You can recognize that top structure as an alkane because all you see are carbons and hydrogens. Those are the only elements you see. We just have carbon and hydrogen. Also notice that all of the carbon-carbon bonds, all the carbon-carbon connections, ones that I'm highlighting right now in yellow, are single bonds. That's what's telling you that this is an alkane. Some other things to notice about this structure. A couple slides ago, we talked about the number of bonds that you are seeing with each specific element in these organic compounds. Here you're seeing it in play with our very first structure. We said in organic compounds, hydrogen only has one bond. And look at all of those hydrogens in the molecule. Every hydrogen in that molecule has one bond. If you look at all of the carbons in this molecule, all of the carbons in this molecule have four bonds. If I just pick out a carbon to kind of highlight that, you know, highlighting green, here's one bond for that carbon, here's another bond for that carbon, here's another bond for that carbon, here's another bond for that carbon. You can see very clearly the four bonds that each carbon has in this molecule. So we're going to try to name this compound, and right away we can see that this is now an alkane, and we know it's an alkane because only carbon and hydrogen again, and all of the carbons are singly bonded. Now we talked about patterns being very important when we're dealing with organic compounds. We're gonna to try to follow the exact same pattern every time we're naming a compound or we're writing the structure of a compound. And then generally what I would highly recommend you do is when you're writing the name of a compound, you kind of go backwards in terms of the name. So let's talk about how we name this. Because this is an alkane, I'm going to put the alkane ending, the alkane suffix in there. We just talked about alkanes end in A-N-E, so I'm going to get the A-N-E in there for this name. So because it's an alkane, the ending will always be A-N-E. Now, the next part of the name describes how many carbons are connected in the longest continuous carbon chain. So if we look at the longest continuous carbon chain, let's count out the carbons. One, two, three, four, 
five. We have five carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain. So we want to think, what is that prefix that we use for five? Well, the prefix we associate with five is pent. So that's going to be the front part of the name. So I'm going to add that. And the name of this molecule is going to be pentane. Every organic molecule that we write has this patterning to it. At the very ending, that A and E, that tells you the FG for functional group. What functional group are we talking about? Well, right now we only know one functional group, the alkane. So everything right now is going to have that A and E ending. But as we learn new functional groups, that ending is going to change. The ending is always associated with the functional group. Then what you will always see as well is that prefix that describes how many carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain. So you're always going to see these features in these organic compounds that we're naming. The ending is always going to be the functional group. What goes in front of that is how many carbons are part of that longest continuous carbon chain. You always end up seeing those things in play. So the name of this compound at the top is pentane. Now if we look at the structure I wrote at the bottom, the structure I wrote at the bottom is also pentane. It's just written in a different form. The top structure is what's written and called the expanded form. And the expanded form shows each individual carbon and hydrogen bond. There's another way we can write these compounds, and that's what you see at the bottom, and that is the condensed structure. What the condensed structure does is it collapses all of the carbon-hydrogen bonds onto that carbon, where you're not seeing those individual carbon-hydrogen bonds. Now, they're still there. They're just not expressly, explicitly shown. It's more of a condensed format. And we can see that we're really looking at the exact same structures. If we look at this carbon that I'm kind of drawing arrows with in purple, that carbon at the top has three hydrogens that are bonded to it. Well, if I kind of collapse that down, look at that carbon on the bottom. They correspond. Now I have three hydrogens. That CH3 we're looking at here in the bottom is still showing the same thing. Those three hydrogens are bonded to that carbon. They're just not individually shown. If I go one carbon over, if I go over to the next carbon in blue, how many hydrogens are bonded to that carbon? Well, two are bonded to that carbon. If I kind of correspond that to what we see in the condensed structure, CH2, I see two hydrogens still bonded. I'm just not showing each individual hydrogen. If I kind of go on the one that I'm pointing at at orange, what do I have? Well, here I have in the expanded structure two hydrogens expressively shown in the expanded structure. We can condense that down to CH2 in that condensed structure. If I move one more carbon over, if I look at the carbon I'm pointing at in green now, two hydrogens attached to that carbon, that's going to condense down to my condensed structure for CH2. If I look at the very last carbon, the one all the way on the right on the end, what do I have? The one I'm pointing at in red now? Well, the top we can see clearly the three hydrogens that are individually shown. I can condense that down into a condensed structure to show CH3. So the top and the bottom are really the same molecules, just written in a different form. One is written in the expanded structure on the top, showing all of those individual carbon-hydrogen bonds. The one at the bottom kind of shows them being collapsed, more of a condensed structure. 
in terms of a non-chemistry analogy to kind of help you visualize this is I want you to think about an umbrella. Your umbrella can either be opened or closed. If your umbrella is open, well, you can see all of the support structures, all of the metal, all of the individual plastic. It's open. It's expanded. You can look and see each individual part. When you close the umbrella, well, when you close the umbrella, those connections, that metal, that plastic holding everything together is still there. You're just not directly looking at it. You can think about that the same way as the expanded structure and the condensed structure. The condensed structure, you're not looking at the individual details of each carbon-hydrogen bond. Now, what we're going to do is you'll see both of these structures written and used. I think it's easiest when you're first doing organic compounds to always write the expanded structure. It is a little bit larger, takes a little bit more time to write, but when you're first learning these, it's a little bit easier to see and deal with and count the bonds. So what you're going to see is for the next sets of examples we're going to do, we're going to be writing expanded structures. Then after we've gotten a little bit more comfortable with organic compounds, then you'll see we won't be writing expanded structures anymore. We'll be writing condensed structures. Our goal is to be able to get to writing and seeing condensed structures. But we're going to start our first sets of examples with expanded. And then you'll see we'll kind of, after we get a little more comfortable looking at these, we'll switch over and start looking more and more at condensed structures and less and less at expanded structures. So, so here we're going to be looking at a couple more examples. So starting with the structure on the top. Now, first thing we notice and see about the structure at the top is, again, it's an alkane. We recognize that it's an alkane because we only have carbon and hydrogen. And all the carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds. We don't see any carbon-carbon double bonds or triple bonds. Everything's a single bond. So that's what tells us we're dealing with an alkane. So I'm going to get the alkane ending in here. Alkane ending is A and E. Now what we also have to describe is how many carbons are in this longest continuous carbon chain. Well, we can count them out. One, two, three carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain. What prefix do we want to use for three carbons? Well, for three carbons, we want to use the prefix prop. So this becomes what you are familiar with, propane. And this is the compound that you're using in your gas grills outside. It's a propane grill. This is the compound that is the fuel source for that. And again, when you're looking at these names and these structures, what are you always seeing? The ending is always describing the functional group. Right now we only have alkane, so we're only seeing that A and E ending. What do we see up front? Up front, we see that prefix describing how many carbons in that carbon chain. You're going to see this pattern over and over and over again. When we, when we talk about patterns in organic compounds, this is a pattern you see repeatedly. Functional group describes the ending. Carbon chain describes the prefix that you have with that ending. If we look at the structure on the bottom, the structure on the bottom is also an alkane. We only have carbon-hydrogen bonds. All of the carbons are connected by single bonds, so we only have carbon-hydrogen. Carbon's connected in a single bond fashion, so that's going to make this an alkane. So I'm going to get that alkane ending in here. The prefix that we are going to attach to that is based upon how many carbons are we dealing with. So we count the carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine carbons in this compound. 
Well, nine carbons in this compound. The prefix we associate with nine is known. So this becomes nonane. You see that same pattern. You see the functional group ending, the carbon chain length described using that prefix. What we want to be able to do is not just take a molecule and write the name for it. We need to be able to go in the reverse order as well. We need to be able to take a name and then from that name be able to write a structure from that. So here's an example going this opposite way. So what do we have? We have hexane. Well, what does that name tell us? Remember what the name tells us. The A-N-E is telling us what the functional group is. We're dealing with an alkane. What is the hex telling us? Well, the hex is telling us how many carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain. So the hex is describing what's happening with the actual carbon chain. So we're going to use that in order to correctly write this structure. So when we're writing structures, we want to really focus on getting the carbons in place first. Organic compounds, organic chemistry is based upon the carbons. We're not going to worry about the hydrogens at the beginning. We want to get the carbons connected correctly first. Well, how are we going to get the carbons in place? Well, the hex tells me how many carbons I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with six carbons. So being I'm dealing with six carbons, I'm going to write out six carbons. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six carbons in place. They're all singly bonded. I have one bond connecting each carbon to the other carbons. Because it's an alkane, I'm only going to have carbon carbon single bonds. So what I have up right now on the slide represents what we would sometimes call the carbon skeleton or the carbon backbone. Once you're satisfied with how the carbon skeleton or how the carbon backbone looks, it's at that point that you can fill in hydrogens. Well, how do you know how many hydrogens to fill in? You know how many hydrogens you have to fill in based upon recognizing how many bonds each element gets. So let's kind of use that. If I look at the carbon all the way on the left, how many bonds does that carbon currently have? Well, right now that carbon only has one bond to it. How many bonds does carbon need in these structures? Carbon needs four bonds in these structures. Right now it has one. That's telling me how many hydrogens I need to place on that carbon. Carbon has one bond. It needs four. To get up to four bonds, we'll make three hydrogens that will need to be added to that. That's going to bring carbon up to the four bonds. If I look at the next carbon over, how many bonds do I have on that carbon? Well, next carbon over, I have two bonds. Well, to get up to four bonds, how am I going to do that? I have two bonds in place. I'll need two hydrogens attached to that carbon. If I look one more carbon over, how many bonds do I have for that carbon? Well, I have two. I got to get that up to four. That means I'm going to need two hydrogens attached to that carbon. Next carbon over, two bonds, how many hydrogens? Well, to get up to four, I would need two hydrogens added onto that. Next carbon over, two bonds you'll see. To get up to four would require two hydrogens that I can place in. The carbon all the way at the end. So the carbon all the way on the right hand side, how many bonds does it currently have? It has one bond currently. How many does it need? It needs four. How am I going to achieve those four bonds? Starting at one, so I need to get three hydrogens in in order to get the total number of bonds up to four. So whenever you're writing structures for organic compounds, 
what you want to do is you want to start with the carbons. Get the carbons connected properly. Always, always, always save the hydrogens for the very end. So, so far, every example that we have seen has been what's been called a straight chain alkane. And what that means is all of the carbons were connected in a continuous pattern. There's another type of alkanes we need to talk about, and these are called branched alkanes. So in a branched alkane, all the carbons are not connected in one continuous carbon chain. Instead, some of the carbons exist in one or more branches. So we're going to do some examples that describe that. This slide lists all of the rules. So we'll briefly talk about the rules, but then we'll employ these rules to actually naming some compounds. So we need to name the molecule such that the size and the location of the branches are accurately described. Right? A name completely describes that molecule. So one way of thinking about this is we can maybe, in a non-chemistry way, relate this to how you might describe a tree. If you were trying to describe a tree to somebody and you couldn't take a picture, there's lots of different things you would have to describe about that tree. Part of it is the size and location of the branches. So that's kind, kind of going to be a similarity here. What we're going to see is when we're talking about a branch, we're going to use this YL ending used to describe branches. And that's reserved in organic nomenclature to specifically talk about branches. We're going to use numbers are starting going to be employed to describe the branch locations with respect to the carbon chain. What we'll see is that there'll be some additional prefixes, two for di, three for tri, four for tetra, if we have multiple branches of that same size. Sometimes we're going to have branches on a compound of different sizes. And what we're going to see with an example is that they are named in alphabetical order. So what we're going to do is we'll be doing some examples of branched alkanes using these rules. So the very first molecule we want to look at is the one on the upper left hand side of the screen. Right away when we look at this molecule, we're going to recognize that it is an alkane. How do we know it's an alkane? Well, we can look. We only see carbon and hydrogen. Being we only see carbon and hydrogen and all of the carbons are singly bonded, that's what tells us we have an alkane. So I'm going to get that alkane ending in here, that A-N-E ending. Next, we would describe how many carbons are part of that longest continuous carbon chain. Not total carbons. How many carbons are part of that longest continuous carbon chain? So one, two, three, four, five in that longest continuous carbon chain. There may be six total carbons, but in that longest continuous carbon chain, there are only five. So what prefix do we use for five? Well, we said the prefix we use for five is pent. So we get that in there. Now, we already drew the structure for pentane previously. This is not pentane. This is definitely different than pentane. Why is this different than pentane? Well, it's different from pentane because what do we have? We have a branch. I'm circling this kind of in green. We have that branch. Notice that carbon in that branch is not part of the longest continuous carbon chain. It's existing as a branch. So whenever we have a branch, we have to describe that branch. And there's two things we need to describe with that branch. The first thing we need to describe is how many carbons are in that branch. 
Well, if you look at what I circled in green, that branch has one carbon. What prefix do we use to describe one carbon? Well, one carbon, we would use the meth prefix. Now, that is a branch. So what I circled is a branch. We said to signify that we're dealing with a branch, we're going to use the YL ending. So we have a methyl branch, a one carbon branch. That's what that methyl is telling us. There's one other thing we need to do when we're dealing with organic compounds. We can again think about this similar to a tree. If you're trying to describe a tree to somebody, you might describe how large the branches are. You might also describe the positioning of the branches. Are the branches close to the ground, halfway up, you know, at the very top? We need to do the exact same thing here. And the way we do that is with numbers. And what we end up doing is we end up numbering the carbon chain. And we're going to number it two different ways. The first way is we're just going to number the carbon chain left to right. So in red, one, two, three, four, five. Now that's one choice we have what's written in red. We have a, another way we could number the chain. We could number from the other side. I'm going to show that in blue. So going right to left, we'd say one, two, three, four, five. So what number system do we want to use? And there's a very general rule that we're going to apply for this. We're always going to use the number system that gives the branch the lowest possible number. So where is that branch located? Well, if we look at the positioning of that branch using the red numbering system, it would be on the second carbon. Using the blue numbering system, it would be on the fourth carbon. We always use the lowest possible number. So using the lowest possible number, that branch is at position 2. So this becomes 2-methylpentane for this name. Now, what we want to do is we want to talk about each of the parts of the name. Each part of the name is part of that patterning that gets repeated over and over and over again for every single organic compound that we're looking at. Let's kind of go through and review that. That A-N-E ending, what did that tell us? That told us the functional group. We're dealing with an alkane still. The pent, what did that tell us? That told us what was going on with the carbon chain. This time we have a branch. We're putting that branch out in front of the name. What does that methyl signify? That methyl signifies the sides of the branch. How many carbons are in that branch? What does the number all the way out in front represent? That two? That two is describing the location of that branch. And you're seeing this pattern repeated over and over and over again. Each part of the name corresponds to a very specific thing within that structure. So what I want to do next is I want us to look at the compound, the structure I drew in the upper right hand part of the screen. And what we're going to see is that in reality, it's the exact same molecule. I'm going to show that both of these structures are the same. They're just written from a different perspective. So let's kind of look at it. If we look at the structure on the upper right-hand side, we would say, okay, it is a alkane. We only see carbon and hydrogen. How many carbons are in it? that longest continuous carbon chain, we'd have one, two, three, four, five. So we would be at pentane again. We would have a branch. Circling the branch here in green. How many carbons are part of that branch? Well, one carbon is part of that branch, so it would be a methyl branch. 
So we'd also have to describe the location of that branch. So we would have to try two different numbering systems. We'd try left to right, one, two, three, four, five, or going the opposite way, right to left, one, two, three, four, five. Again, the branch location gets used describing the lowest number that's possible. So if we look at where that branch is at, in the red numbering system, it'd be at position four. In the blue numbering system, it'd be at position two. So the structure on the right, we would have to use the blue numbering system to give it the lowest possible number. We would wind up with two methyl pentane again. You're always using the lowest possible number. Because these two structures have the exact same name, that tells us they're the exact same structure. And that's one of the things that can be a little bit confusing with our organic compounds, is sometimes we can draw them in very different perspectives or orientations. They're still the exact same molecule. The only difference between the structure on the left and the structure on the right is one of it is flipped around compared to the other. And you can think about this the same way you do a person. Okay? That person has the same identity whether you're looking at them from the front, whether you're looking at them from the back, or you're looking at them from the side, they're still the same person. They have the same identity even though your perspective of them changed. So I wanted to show this example to really illustrate you know, that you really have to be careful with the numbering and the name. When you first look at these two compounds, they may look like different compounds, but when you really go through and analyze it, you're seeing that they're really the exact same. It's just that the molecule has been rotated. So here we want to look at another example of naming a branched alkane. So first we recognize that we are dealing with an alkane. Alkanes only have carbon and hydrogen. All of the carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds, so that's what's going to make this an alkane. So I'm going to get the alkane ending in here, that A-N-E ending. Next, we would put how many carbons are part of that longest continuous carbon chain. So we'd count the carbons in the longest chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We would have seven carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain. The prefix we would associate with seven is hept, so we would get the appropriate prefix in here. So we'd be looking at a heptane, but we also have a branch. If I circle our branch, we have to deal with this branch. So when we're dealing with a branch, the first thing we care about is how many carbons are part of that branch. Well, there are two carbons in that branch. So the prefix for two is F. Being it is a branch, we always add that YL ending to signify and identify it as a branch. So we would have an ethyl branch here. The last piece is then describing where that branch is. What is the location of that branch? So in order to do that, we need to number the carbon chain. And we can either go left to right or right to left. So going left to right in red, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or we could try the opposite way, starting from the other end, going right to left. We could say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the numbering system that we have to use is a numbering system that gives the branch the lowest possible number. So in the red system, that branch would either be at position five. Using the blue numbering system, it would be at position three. The lowest possible number would be three, so we would need to use the blue numbering system. That branch is at position three, so that would make this 
3-ethyl heptane for our name. And again, you're seeing the same things over and over again as part of this name. What are you seeing? Well, that A-N-E ending, what's that telling us? It's telling us a functional group. We're dealing with an alkane. The hept, what are we seeing there? That's describing how many carbons are part of the longest continuous carbon chain. The ethyl, what's that describing? That's describing the size of the branch. And finally, the number out in front, what is the location of that branch? You see that pattern repeated over and over and over again in all the different structures that we are looking at. If we do a, another one, so again, what type of compound are we looking at? Well, it's an alkane. It's the only one we've learned so far, but we can recognize it because we only have carbon and hydrogen and all of the carbons are singly bonded. So we are definitely dealing with an alkane. Next, we would say, how many carbons are part of that longest continuous carbon chain? Well, we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain. Well, six carbons, the prefix for six is hex, so we would get that in for the prefix to describe the correct number of carbon chains. Next, we would deal with our branches. So here we have two branches. If I circle the branches so we can look at them a little bit easier, I have a branch here. And circling in green, we have a branch here as well. So we really have two branches set up. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, the way we deal with that is how large is each branch? Well, each branch is one carbon in size. So being it is one carbon in size, they are methyl branches. But instead of writing out each branch separately, instead of saying methyl, methyl, that becomes quite cumbersome and a mouthful, we can kind of condense that. How many methyl branches do we have? We actually have two methyl branches. So here's where that prefix di comes in. That di is describing that we have two branches, two methyl branches, two different methyl branches that we have. We still have to describe locations for these, so we would number the carbon chain. So we can go left to right in red. One, two, three, four, five, six. Or right to left in blue. One, two, three, four, five, Six. We still have to describe the location of these branches. So which are we going to choose, the red numbering system or the blue? Well, let's look at it. If we use the red numbering system, the branches would be at positions 2 and 4. If we used the blue numbering system, they'd be at 3 and 5. So 2 and 4 is less than 3 and 5, so we must use the red numbering system. So we would have our numbers out in front be 2, comma 4. Each branch would get a number because we have to describe the location of each branch. So our name would be 2,4-dimethylhexane. And again, when we are looking at at this name, this each part of the name is describing a specific feature of the molecule. The A-N-E ending, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us we're dealing with an alkane. The hex, how many carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain? The methyl, the size of the branch or branches. The dye is describing that we have two methyl branches. And finally, the numbers, 2 and 4, they're describing the locations of the branches. 
something very important to note about this example. You're only choosing one numbering system. It is either red or blue. You can't mix and match. You can't say, well, I'm going to use the red to describe one branch and the blue to describe another branch. You can't mix and match the numbering system. You have to be consistent. It's either red or it is blue. It's not red for one branch, blue for one branch, or blue for one branch, red for one branch. You can't do that. You're picking one numbering system. And once you've decided what numbering system is appropriate, you can go ahead and erase the other numbering system just so you're not tempted to accidentally use it. But you can't mix and match numbering systems. You can only use one. Here we want to look at a, another example. Again, we're dealing with an alkane. So we recognize it's an alkane because we only have carbon and hydrogen. We don't have any other elements. So we're dealing with an alkane. Only carbon and hydrogen, the carbons are singly bonded. So that's what tells us we're dealing with an alkane. Next, we would look at how many carbons are part of that longest continuous carbon chain. And if we count it out, we'd have one, two, three, four, five. Five carbons as part of that longest continuous carbon chain. Well, the prefix for five is pent. So we would get that as pentane. Now we have branches. Okay, I'm circling the branches. We have a branch here and we have a branch here. Something that's very important to note here. This is not the same branch. These are different branches. One way of thinking about it is think about your arms. You have two arms. It's not one arm connected through the shoulder. You have two arms. Just because the branches are coming off the same part of the carbon chain doesn't mean it's one branch. Just like it's not one arm, you have two arms coming off of your torso. They're just coming off at the same point. So here, the branch size is methyl. Each branch is one carbon in size. That's going to make it a methyl branch. We just happen to have two of them. So instead of methyl methyl, we can condense that down into dimethyl. Now we still have to describe locations. And to describe the locations, we will have to number the carbon chain. So we can go left to right. We'll do that in red. One, two, three, four, five. Or we could try numbering from right to left in blue. One, two, three, four, five. Now we have to describe which numbering system we're going to use. Well, if we use the red system, we'd be at position four. If we use the blue system, we would be at position two. So we need to use the blue numbering system. So that puts both of the branches at position two. And this may seem a little bit weird, but you have to write the two twice. So it's 2,2-dimethylpentane. Two, two and the reason you have to write the 2 twice is because you have two different branches. Each branch gets a number description for where it's at. If you just listed it at 2-dimethylpentane, didn't put the second 2 there, well, you're not being clear. The reader or the listener, whoever is looking at that, is then having to kind of guess or assume where that second branch is. You need to make sure you're completely clear. You have to list the two twice. Each branch will get a number, even if it's at the same location as the other branch. So this will be 2,2-dimethylpentane. So 2,2 dimethylpentane. Again, you're looking at the same parts of the name. The A-N-E ending tells us we're dealing with a alkane. The pent told us our number of carbon chains, five carbons in the chain. 
Methyl is describing the size of the branch. The dye, again, represents that we have two methyl branches. And finally, the numbers are describing the location of those branches. Now, one of the common things that when you first start doing these, what you'll probably see is that you're getting mixed up with the numbers. When we're dealing with organic compounds, numbers are always describing location. The numbers aren't describing how many carbons. Numbers always describe locations. The number of carbons are dealt with using the prefixes, meth, eth, probe, you know, bute, pent, hex, hep. Those are describing how many carbons. Numbers will always be location describers. If we look at a, another example, this example, we're going in the opposite direction. We're starting with a name, and we're going to be asked to write what that structure is. So for this one, what do we want to kind of pick out in this name? Well, the A-N-E ending, what's that describing? Well, we're dealing with an alkane, so we're only dealing with carbon hydrogen, carbon, carbon, single bonds. The pent, what's that describing? How many carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain? So again, whenever you're writing structures, you want to start with just the carbons. Get the carbons connected correctly. Well, how many carbons do I have in my longest continuous carbon chain? Well, I'm going to have five. That's what the pent is telling me. Let's get five carbons in here. So I got my five carbons in there. They're all singly bonded. What can I start taking care of next? Well, next I want to take care of the branches. Well, what's going on with the branches? I have methyl branches. That means one carbon. How many of them do I have? The dye is describing that I have two of them. The two and the three are describing what the locations of those are. So here, when you're drawing the structure, you're in more control. Than when you're naming. When you're drawing the structure, you can decide, am I going to go left to right or right to left? And I think for most of us, based upon the way we typically write, we're used to writing left to right. So most of us would probably start going left to right. And that's how I'm going to continue this example. I'm going to start on the left-hand side and number that away. So what does that 2,3-dimethyl tell us? Well, that tells us that we have a methyl branch on the second carbon, and we have a methyl branch on the third carbon. That's what that is telling us. This is that carbon skeleton. This is that carbon backbone. Notice I haven't put in any hydrogen yet until I'm happy with how the carbons are connected. Do I have 2,3-dimethyl pentane? Yes, I have an alkane. I have all my carbons singly bonded. Five carbons in my longest continuous carbon chain. I have two branches, that's a dimethyl, and they're correctly positioned on position two and position three. Now, in the structure I just drew, I put on position two, I had that carbon pointed down and the branch on position three pointed up. It doesn't matter whether you put it in that way or the opposite way. I could have put the carbon branch on position two pointed up and the one in position three pointed down. I could have put them both pointed up. I could have put them both pointed down. It doesn't matter. It's just different perspectives of the same molecule. So whether you stick a branch up or down or both up or both down, or one up and one down, or the reverse, one down and one up. It just doesn't matter. It's the exact same structure, just looking at it from a different vantage point, from a different orientation. So here I have my carbon skeleton. My carbon backbone is in place. The very last step is filling in the appropriate number of hydrogens. So to fill in hydrogens, what am I going to do? I'm going to use that four bond to carbon rule. 
I'm going to look at how many bonds each carbon currently has and then fill in hydrogens to bring that total up to four. So the carbon all the way on the left, I have one bond, so that means I'm going to need three hydrogens. So I'm going to add three hydrogens to this. One, two, three. Next carbon over, how many bonds? One, two, three bonds. That means to get up to four bonds, I need to add one hydrogen. The carbon sticking down this part of the branch, how many bonds does it currently have? It has one. To get up to four bonds, I would need three hydrogens attached to it. Next carbon over in the chain, how many bonds does it have? One, two, three bonds. How many do I really need? I need four, so I need to add a hydrogen. The carbon that's part of the branch pointed up, how many bonds? I have one bond. So to get up to four, I would need three hydrogens attached in order to get up to four total bonds. Next carbon over in the chain, I have two bonds. To get up to four bonds, I would add two hydrogens. And finally, that carbon all the way on the right. So that carbon all the way on the right has one, just one bond. To get up to four bonds, I would need to add three hydrogens to it. So remember, when you're writing structures, take care of the carbons, the connections, the branches first. You're always filling in those hydrogens at the very end. And the reason why you want to do that is if you start putting in hydrogens too early, what you'll probably end up with is the incorrect structure because you won't end up with four bonds to carbon. Always, always, always save those hydrogens for the end. So here we want to do a, another example. Again, what are we looking at? Well, we only know one functional group, that's the alkanes, and this one's definitely an alkane, and we can recognize that only carbon and hydrogen. All of the carbons are connected by single bonds. Our next step in naming this is going to be figuring out how many carbons are part of that longest continuous carbon chain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons as part of that longest continuous carbon chain. The prefix for seven is hept, so we want to get that in there. Next, we would need to describe branches. So if I circle the branches that we have, so I have one branch down here that I'm circling in green. I also have a branch up top that I'm circling in green. So I have two different branches. Now these two branches that I just circled have different branch sizes. The one on the bottom is two carbons. That's going to make it an ethyl branch. The one on the top has one carbon that's going to make it a methyl branch. So I have both a methyl branch and an ethyl branch. Which one comes first? Well, when you have branches of two different sizes, you list them alphabetically. So alphabetically, the ethyl will come first, the methyl will come second. And the reason for that is alphabetical. E in the alphabet comes before M. So I have an ethyl branch and I have a methyl branch. So now I still need to describe locations for these. So to describe locations, I need to number the carbon chain. So going left to right, we'll try in red. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or Right to left, in blue, we could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we're looking at red or blue. So in red, our branches would be at positions two and three. In blue, our positions would be five and six. So we have to use the red numbering system. 
And here's where you have to be careful. You can't just randomly put the two and the three in the name. You have to put them matching with what they're describing. At position two, what type of branch do I have at position two? Well, at position two, I have that one carbon branch. That's the methyl branch. So I need to put the two with the methyl. On position three, that is where my ethyl branch is. So I need to put the three with the ethyl. You can't just randomly put the numbers places. The number goes to describing something very, very specific. The number has to go with what it's describing. The ethyl branch is at position three, so that's where the three ethyl is coming from. The methyl branch is at position two, that's where that two methyl is coming from. The ethyl came first because of alphabetical order. And again, you still see the same parts of the name. Functional group ending, A-N-E, we're describing the alkane. Carbon chain hept, how many carbons in that longest, longest continuous carbon chain. Branch sizes, we had a methyl branch and an ethyl branch describing the size of each branch. The three and the two, what are those doing? Those are describing the locations of each one of our branches. I want to put this example up to just show us that we have to be careful. The longest continuous carbon chain does not have to be written horizontally. So far in every example that we've done, it has been written horizontally, but it doesn't have to be. And I want to do this to kind of show how careful we really need to be when we're looking at carbon chains and counting them. Here's where you have to be careful is if you just first look at this, well, first you're going to recognize that now we're going to start dealing with condensed structures. So we're switching over to condensed structures. They're the more standard form compared to expanded. But even though we're dealing with condensed structures, what are we really looking at? Well, you have to be careful. It's very tempting to just say, oh, well, the horizontal is going to be the longest continuous carbon chain. And then you would describe everything else as branches. There's a branch, there's a branch, there's a branch. But that's not how it works. Okay, It's the longest continuous carbon chain. It doesn't have to be written horizontally. Some of these branches that I circled in green right now aren't actually branches. And this is why you have to be careful. So how can you tell if you're dealing with the longest continuous carbon chain? Well, the longest continuous carbon chain just means that it doesn't backtrack. It doesn't have to be written horizontally. So I'll kind of trace this out in yellow again. But if I start, I'm tracing out in yellow. I'm looking at that. Well, I haven't picked up or backtracked at all. And I'm able to hit all of these carbons. So on the ends, those ones that initially were maybe tempting to call branches, turns out are not actual branches. They're part of the carbon chain. I can go all the way from one end to another without breaking that continuous chain. The only branch that we actually have in this compound is the one that I'm going to circle in green right now. The only actual branch is this one. All the other ones are part of the chain. One way to, you know, check yourself to make sure you're making sure you're counting the number of carbons in the chain correctly is there's kind of a rule. You can't have a branch on the first or the last carbon because a branch on the first or the last carbon is not really a branch at all. A branch on the first or last carbon is really describing, hey, those carbons are actually part of the chain. So you can check yourself on that. Can you go from one end to another without backtracking, without repeating? And what I have highlighted in yellow is that longest continuous carbon chain. It's just not written 
horizontally. Remember, we've said this several times before already in this presentation that you can write organic compounds in many different perspectives. Rotate around, flip from left to right, flip from top to bottom. Well, this is just another perspective. It's not written in the perspective maybe you were expecting or assuming it would be written in, but that's why we just have to be careful. The longest continuous carbon chain does not have to be written horizontally, and this example shows it. So we're still going to name this one, just like we've named all the other ones. It's still an alkane. All the carbons are connected by single bonds, and we only have carbon hydrogen, so it's still an alkane. How many carbons are part of that longest continuous carbon chain? Well, I highlighted out in yellow that longest continuous carbon chain. How many carbons are in there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight carbons would make this an octane. We do have a branch. The branch is circled in green. How many carbons are in that branch? There is one carbon in that branch, so that makes it a methyl branch. We still have to describe the location of this branch. So remember, we have to try both numbering systems. So going in one direction from one end in red, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Or I could try numbering from the other end. I'll do this in blue. I could have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we look and we decide which numbering system gives us the lowest possible number. Well, in red, it would be at position four. In blue, it would be at position five. We have to choose the lowest possible number. That would make this at position four. So this would become four methyl octane. And again, we see all the appropriate parts of the name. The A-N-E ending to describe the functional group. Oct told us how many carbons were in that longest continuous carbon chain. Methyl described the branch size. The number four described the location of that branch. We're seeing that pattern over and over and over again in every single name and every single structure that we're looking at. There's a third type of alkane we want to discuss. We started with the straight chain alkanes. We just finished with the branched alkanes, but there's a third type, and this third type is called the cycloalkanes. And these are alkanes that form a continuous cycle, meaning that the ends are brought together. We add cyclo to the name, and sometimes we use geometric shapes as kind of a really quick shorthand shortcut to represent these. So we want to look at a couple examples of cycloalkanes. So here we're looking at a cycloalkane. How do we know it's an alkane? Well, if we look at it as an alkane, I only have carbon and hydrogen. So I only have carbon and hydrogen. All of the carbons are singly bonded to each other. So that's what tells us we have an alkane. So normally we would think about how many carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain. Well, here we don't have kind of a continuous chain. It's how many carbons form the cycle. One, two, three, four, and then we kind of wrap around to finish that cycle. So there's four carbons forming this cycle. So we already described this as an alkane. We would have that A-N-E ending that we would use. How many carbons in the chain or the cycle? Well, there's four. The prefix for four is but. Because it is forming a cyclic structure, it is forming a cycle, we attach the cyclo out in front because this isn't normal butane. 
this is cyclobutane. So here you also see I have three different representations of the cyclobutane. In the upper left, I have the expanded structure. In the upper right, I have the condensed structure. And then in the lower right-hand part, what you see is kind of the geometric representation of that. And the geometric representation is a really quick shorthand for writing these structures. Each corner that you see in these geometric representations, I'm highlighting them in yellow, represents a carbon atom. And so it kind of matches the geometric shape and you don't actually put in any hydrogen. So when you have cycloalkanes, ones that have formed a cyclic structure, you attach the cyclo prefix out in front. If we look at one going a different direction, starting with the name and writing the structure, we would have cyclohexane. Well, what are the different parts of the name telling us? Well, the A-N-E ending tells us we're dealing with an alkane, so only carbon and hydrogen involved. The hex tells us how many carbons we're dealing with. And the cyclo out in front, what's that telling us? That's telling us that these are hooked together in a cyclic structure. So we're going to write the structure for this. So writing the structure for this, we'd have six carbons in a cyclic structure. So I'm going to get my six carbons in in a cyclic structure. They would all be attached by single bonds. So now I have that carbon skeleton, that carbon backbone in place. And now I could either write this as an expanded or a condensed structure. I'm going to choose to write this as the condensed structure because from here on out, we're kind of going to be not writing expanded structures. We're going to move into writing condensed structures. So to write the condensed structure, we're just looking at filling in the appropriate number of hydrogens. So if I look at the carbon on the top, carbon at the top has two bonds to get up to four. I would need two hydrogen, two hydrogens. Again, I'm writing condensed structures now. Now if I go clockwise around this ring or the cyclic structure, next carbon has two bonds. So to get up to four, I would need two hydrogens. Next carbon still going clockwise, two bonds. So that means I would need two hydrogens to get up to four total bonds for that carbon. Next structure over, two bonds. That's going to mean two hydrogens to get up to four. Next carbon, two bonds, two hydrogens. Next carbon, two bonds, two hydrogens, because every carbon will need four bonds. So this is a condensed structure. What you could have also done is potentially write the geometric structure. The geometric structure just represents the kind of shape that this molecule has. So six kind of looks like a hexagon where every corner that you see represents a carbon atom. So we have carbon atom here, carbon atom here, carbon atom here, 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 and here. And then we don't fill in any of the hydrogens. So again, these cyclic alkanes are actually much more simple than the branched alkanes. You're just a, forming a cyclic structure when you're writing them. You're essentially attaching the ends together. And in the name, that's represented by that cyclo out in front. All the same other rules that we've talked about still apply. You're still having carbon-carbon single bonds. Every carbon still gets four total bonds. That helps you figure out how many hydrogens you need to place in. The last thing we want to talk about in this presentation are the idea of isomers. And what isomers are, are isomers are compounds that have the same molecular formula, but different structures. And it's a definition of what it means to be an isomer. 
And because they have different structures, they're truly different compounds. These are going to have different physical properties. So things like melting point, boiling point, density are all going to be different. They'll also have different chemical properties. Remember, chemical properties describe things like how they react. So I'm going to do an isomer example or show you what isomers are with some alkane isomers. But it's not limited to alkanes. Isomers don't just happen with alkanes. They can happen for any of the functional groups that we talked about. So what I've done on this slide is I've written the different isomers of C5H12. So things that have five carbons and 12 hydrogens in them. And it turns out there are five different ways you can, or sorry, there are three different ways. So three different ways that you can connect five carbons and 12 hydrogens together. And I've written those out. You know, so kind of the first way I've written out, and that's just connecting all the carbons in a straight chain. CH3, CH2, 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 CH3, and we can name that. That would be pentane. I could connect things a slightly different way, though. That's what you see is the second way. I could also connect them having four carbons in a chain and placing one of the carbons as a branch. I also correctly named this one as 2-methyl-butane. There's a third way I could connect five carbons and 12 hydrogens. That's what you see across the bottom. I could have three carbons in that longest continuous carbon chain and have two single carbon branches. This would be 2,2-dimethylpropane. When you look at all three of those structures I wrote, they all have five carbons and 12 hydrogens in them but the way they're connected is different. And because they are connected differently, they are truly different compounds. These three compounds, even though they have the same molecular formula, have different physical properties, melting point, boiling point, density. These three compounds would have different chemical properties, how they would react with other compounds. They are truly different even though they have the same number of carbons and hydrogens, five carbons and 12 hydrogens in this specific example. A good piece of advice whenever you're dealing with isomers and trying to write out isomers is, even if you're not explicitly asked to in the problem, also write out the names as well. That's going to make sure that you don't accidentally duplicate the same structure from a different perspective as opposed to truly writing out a new and unique isomer. Kind of one way of thinking about isomers is you can maybe think about isomers the same way in a non-chemical way you might think about houses. Imagine that you had three different lots that you were building houses on and at each of the lots you drop the exact same amount of building material. You block this, you deliver the same amount of concrete, the same amount of bricks, the same amount of wood, the same amount of metal to each house, to each lot that you're trying to build a house on. Then imagine you had three different builders or three different architects work with that same amount of material. Would they build the exact same house? No. Probably not. You might have one that would build a two-story duplex. You might have one that would build a more sprawling ranch. You might have differing number of rooms. Maybe one house would have three bedrooms, another one would have four. Maybe the third house would only have two bedrooms. Would you have different number of bathrooms? Would you have different room sizes, different way the rooms were connected to each other? Yes. If you gave the same building materials to three different architects, three different builders, they're going to build three different houses with the exact same amount of each material. Same thing's happening here. Your building materials are five carbons and 12 hydrogens. It's just they can be put together in multiple different 
ways. That's what you're looking at for isomers. Isomers are compounds that have the same formula, but different structures. And because there are different structures, they are truly different compounds with unique physical and chemical properties. And this is one of the reasons why for organic compounds, you see we're actually drawing structures. If you think back to what we did previously for inorganic compounds, we were just writing formulas. We weren't worried about the structures because generally there's only one way they could be connected together. Here, we can't limit ourselves just to formulas for organic molecules. We have to draw out the explicit structures with how things are connected together because there's multiple different options. And isomers kind of show that with the same set of atoms, they can be put together in several different ways.